I'm Brad Stone, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, U.S. stocks close out a stellar first quarter with tech stocks surging to all-time highs this week. We'll focus on the biggest winners. Plus, BlackBerry turns a profit as it reinvents itself as a software firm. We'll hear from CEO John Chen. And we'll bring you the top tech headlines of the week, including the latest on SpaceX landmark rocket launch. But first to our lead, we close on the books on the first quarter of the year, and it's the best quarter for U.S. stocks since 2015. Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle joins us from New York. Abigail, break down this pretty bullish quarter. Bullish indeed, Brad. It was a great quarter for U.S. stocks. The Dow and the S&P 500 both had their sixth quarterly gain in a row. That's the longest quarterly uh, winning streak for the Dow since 2006. So speak about bullish. The Nasdaq up about 10% on the quarter, its best quarterly performance since 2013. So lots of strength there for the tech heavy and biotech heavy Nasdaq. Take a look at the Russell 2000 though, not a, up as much as the other averages, up about 2%. That's the growth year small cap index. Kind of interesting only because that was the index that led out of the whole Trump trade rally, the reflation trade. So so that could be a potential crack. But sticking with the positive, let's hop into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag BTV7363. Over toward the right in white, that is the SOX or the semiconductor chip index. It is up about 12% on the quarter. In blue, the biotech index up about 10%. The NASDAQ in purple also up about 10%. And then in orange, the Dow. So the tech heavy and the biotech heavy NASDAQ, these sectors are really outperforming in a big way. Now, turning to biotech, what was really strong, lots of big movers on the quarter, absolutely huge gains right across the board, including Vertex. The company really surged. Look at that, up almost 50% on the quarter after a phase three study for cystic fibrosis drug did really very well. We also had Insight trading higher, the DNA company, Illumina, the gene sequencing company trading nicely higher, and then even Amgen, the big biotech giant, Brad, getting a lift from this biotech uh, renaissance. It's really just a very strong quarter for that area of the NASDAQ as well. Wow. So, Abigail, big strength for tech and biotech in the last three months. Is this likely to continue? Well, Brad, that's the million dollar question. Lots of fundamental drivers ahead. From a macro perspective, it, of course, will come down to uh, what are President Trump's uh, policies. Of course, it'll also oil in terms of OPEC. But specific to tech, let's take a look at some of the big tech winners on this month. And we're looking at Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. Take a look at Apple and Facebook, up huge, up 24% on the quarter. Apple, of course, on that iPhone 8 super cycle that everybody's looking forward to. Facebook on a very strong December quarter. Plus, Last quarter, the December quarter, Facebook actually fell about 10%, so a bit of a rebound from the worst quarter from 2012, so some strength there. As for the question of what's ahead, much of it could come down to Apple. When we hop back into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag BTV7346, this is a longer term chart of Apple, and toward the right is the quarterly candle showing Apple up about 24%, the best quarter since 2012, which is boxed in aqua. The the point to be made, though, is we see these rounding areas. The last time that Apple did have that massive quarter in 2012, up 48% in the quarter, it stabilized in sort of a sideways pattern before falling down sharply. We see that that's happened a few other times when Apple has uh, moved up pretty quickly. So it's going to be interesting to see whether or not these gains hold. So that's, that's one thing to keep an eye on Apple. And then, of course, when we take a quick look at the chip uh, sector, lots of strength there on the sector right across the board. Some of the big names, including Broad Broadcom and Skyworks, both Apple suppliers getting a boost there. Micron on DRAM pricing. And then AMD, the turnaround continues, Brad. That stock is up 800% from its 2015 lows. Valuation's a concern here. So between Apple and the valuation of the chip uh, sector, that these are important factors to take a look at in technology as for whether or not the strength can continue into the second quarter, Brad. Okay, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle in New York. Thanks. Let's continue the conversation now on the outlook for tech stocks with an analyst who's bullish on the so-called fangs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. He's also the most bullish on the street when it comes to Snap with a brand new buy rating and a $31 price target. 
RBC Capital's Mark Mahaney joins us now in the studio. Mark, thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Brad. So you've called Snap an innovation machine. What are investors who have brought the stock down 8% since the closing IPO price? What, what are they not getting about the company formerly known as Snapchat? Well, this is going to uh, take a long time to prove out. Um, this will be the most volatile large cap internet stock probably for the next 12 months. So it happens with uh, profitability pushed that far out. Uh, this stock, usually all the value from a financial perspective is in the terminal value. So any little twist is going to cause that uh, terminal value in, uh, to shift around and the stock to shift around. We've also had some competitive news, though. Facebook. The number one big, big risk was whether Instagram and Facebook would ape all of the features. Uh, looks like they're doing that. So I'm not the only one who thinks this has been a great innovation machine. So does Mark Zuckerberg. He thinks right. the same way, and that's why they're trying to so emulate then, some of these features. This week, Facebook introduced stories to, yeah. the, to the main app. Yeah. Of course, Facebook Messenger, Instagram already have it. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're Snap, what, what's your differentiation now? Well, I think if you're a Snap, what you do is you constantly continue to innovate. I mean, obviously, they've done a very good job on it. That's why people are trying to copy what they do. Uh, so I think what, uh, from my perspective, I think what Snap needs to do is make more of its features and its offerings more intuitive to people. And you've seen that. If you look at like the camera screen, the first screen, you've seen they've gone from symbols at the bottom to simple things like chat and stories. I have to say they've, I'm still mystified by Snap. Well, I think that's the upside. Look, what we found is about 50% of millennials in the U.S. use Snap. About 20% of the people in the 35 to 50 year old range, it's probably you, uh, use, you may be below that, no. But Sadly that, it is. <laughs> but, uh, but only 20% of those people use it. So if they can make Make the service more intuitive. Look, I think some of the most the most interesting media experience. If you want to track out, tra track March Madness, go check out the ESPN app or the March Madness or the Bleacher Report app on uh, to the right in the stories on uh, on Snapchat. It's the most interesting thing out there. And look, you know where users are going. They're going to these devices. They're going to mobile phones. People are moving away from TV, except for Bloomberg. They're moving away from TV, and uh, and I think Snap is there. It's in the power alley. So I think they've got tons of growth ahead of them. Even if Facebook tries to emulate some of their features, you just keep innovating. All of these companies have to. Do do that. Look at all the change Facebook has done over the last two years. Snapchat has to do the same thing. And I think they will, but you know, it's a bet. It's a, it's a risky stock, no doubt about it. Okay, let's turn to a company near and dear to both of our hearts, Amazon. Yes. A remarkable admission this week. They closed down the Quizzy brand. They had bought it, I think, in it was 2010, 2011, diapers.com, yeah. uh, wag.com. They said they couldn't make it profitable. What, I mean, Amazon saying they can't make a franchise profitable is, there's irony there. What, what's going on? So I, I was going to ask you that question coming here, but um, uh, it is interesting. I've never heard Amazon doing it. And I think they've shuttered other things in the past, uh, Amazon auctions a long time ago. And so for them to say that, um, I, I found, it, uh, found it interesting. Now, either they're signaling to the public markets that we are finally about profitability, or they just could be, or there may be political reasons, given a large number of employees were in the state of New Jersey, that there may have been that angle to it. Or it just, oh, actually, that's a very good point. Now, with a new administration that seems to be more focused on jobs, you may need to put a little extra explanation into your press releases as to why you're shutting something down. So all of those could be factors. And everything Quizzy sold, all those brands, Amazon, Amazon sold those products itself on the main site. So there was there was some internal competition. And I think a lot of those uh, the features of Quincy have already been integrated into core Amazon. I, you know, that um, uh, Amazon has taken over that asset and it probably took what it needed to and then what was left they probably didn't need to keep. But they had to explain it. And, but there is just the, the intriguing idea that this company has really changed how it thinks about profitability. I doubt you it. You believe? Yeah. No, okay. I don't. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. No, they still invest for the future. Okay, let's talk about Alphabet. Not okay. a great week for the YouTube franchise. Uh, Verizon, AT&T, Johnson & Johnson all pulling their ads from YouTube because of a report uh, that yeah. demonstrated that some of their ads are appearing on extremist hate yeah. speech on YouTube. You know, how, how big of a hit is this for Alphabet and what can they do to rectify it? Well, my guess is that it isn't that big of a hit that they do uh, solve it. This isn't the first time this has come up. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, advertisers were worried about which, what, what videos their ads would be shown against. So it's been a longstanding technology problem for YouTube and I think it's, it's a problem of massive scale. There's something like six million videos uploaded to YouTube on a daily basis and policing all those is a tough thing. I, I, uh, so I think there's a technology challenge. I don't know how to I mean, are that. advertisers using this visibility to this problem, which yes, as you say has to, always been there, to leverage yes. more uh, 
Why would Change that be? The dynamic. Because we're in the upfronts. Uh, could that possibly be? Yeah, I think there's probably a little of that negotiation in going on in the public markets, i.e., through the public press. I bet you there's some of that. But I think advertisers will come back. And why? Because the fastest growing element of internet advertising, I'm sorry, of all advertising, is where Snapchat is, is where Facebook is, and particularly is where YouTube is. And it's mobile video. If you want to reach demographics and if you want to get people who are spending all their time watching video, you know, you need to be on YouTube. I don't think a core advertiser or a large advertiser can afford to be away from YouTube for an extended well, period Well, I've heard of time. you say before that programmatic advertising is the future of TV advertising. Does, does this week change your mind at all? No, I don't think so. I mean, it, look, if um, there are challenges, but if uh, sort of if anybody can do figure this out through artificial intelligence and machine learning, l machine learning, my guess is that it's Google. It's just it's an, it's a problem endemic to society, and it's a problem in, problem endemic to a platform that has that many up, uh, uploads a day. Okay, Mark Mahaney, thank you very much. That's Good RBC you, Capital Mar Markets Analyst Mark Mahaney. And we discussed the latest on Alphabet in this week's Decrypted, Decrypted podcast. You can listen to that episode on iTunes and SoundCloud. Coming up, BlackBerry's revival. Shares are surging Friday after the company increased software sales by 30%. We speak to CEO John Chen about his turnaround strategy next. This is Bloomberg. BlackBerry shares soar the most in 15 months after the company beats its target of $640 million in software revenue for fiscal 2017. Sales from that division rose 30%, achieving a goal set by CEO John Chen. Bloomberg's Garrett DeVink spoke to Chen and started by asking him if he expects this turnaround momentum to continue through the rest of the year. Remember I said, um, you know, the, the consensus right now out there, um, we feel very comfortable and our model just kind of matches that. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the consensus is like uh, five cents, six cents for the year, profitability, um, cash flow positive, and so, and I, that you should go with that. Right, right, okay. I mean, we were talking about this, you know, in, in past quarters about how the market still is not valuing BlackBerry as a software company, and it looks like you're getting closer to that, but you're still, in terms of your multiple, below some of your the other companies, you know, that are pure software plays. Do you think that the, the market will kind of eventually come around and start valuing a little bit higher? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think you know, we do need to execute. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when we make the pivot ch change, it was not easy, as you know, and you've been following our story for a long time. Uh, you know, you can't, it's not a straight line up, right. but we have made the progress that we need to make. And I think the fundamentals are very strong. Right. Um, I think the uh, cybersecurity area is a good area for us, mm -hmm. as you know, that is our heritage. I think the auto and transportation area that, that kind of now intersect with that area right. is a huge area for us. I mean, l literally, when I look through the market, we're the only company that is of any size that could claim to play in that, in that space. So right. I, I think it's it, it, it very, very interesting for us. Yeah. And, and we need to execute it. I, I, if we could repeat doing well, um, yeah. I, you know, a few quarters out, I think the investor will, will wake up. Well, you mentioned autos. And I mean, obviously, you know, even yesterday we had some, some news. I think it was a move that had already but happened. But the announcement that 400 BlackBerry employees were moving to Ford and are now Ford employees helping them with that. Um, I mean, but you have a, a whole partnership with Ford that goes beyond that, that includes you know, current BlackBerry employees, QNX, all these different things. And you mentioned that you could see more of those deeper partnerships with other automakers. So you know, instead of just selling them your products, maybe working on things together. What do you mean by that? I mean, could we see uh, something with GM or one of the European <laughs> automakers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't want to really go into the names. So I'm working on, you know, with our team, we're working on a number of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yes, we, we like to be upfront with them in designing the right. next generation car. You know, I, I, we, we like to go beyond just, hey, you know, I buy something from you and then right. I use it. Um, so we, we like to do that. And, and uh, but it's really resonate with a lot of, I mean, I was in Europe last week. Um, can't tell you who I visited, but okay. I was in Europe. I, I, and and uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was good. Uh, I, I think 
people could understand where BlackBerry add value mm -hmm. there. Right. The um, deadline for H-1B visas is, is coming up very quickly, and I know this is an issue that you know, you're personally passionate about. It's obviously immigration is important for, for your business, for the mm -hmm. larger tech community in the mm -hmm. U.S. Um, you know, we're sort of not exactly sure what is going to happen with the H-1B program, but um, I mean, what is sort of your thinking on that right now, now that we've had a few months since the election? Do you think we will see some serious disruption to that specific H-1B program? And, and I, think, I think the wording from the administrations and public mm -hmm. was the, it was right. Um, I think um, it, it unfortunately got tied up with the whole bigger issue of immigration. Uh, um, but you know, countries in you know, the United States needs more talents in in, in engineering and science, medicine, you know, in many areas. So the H1B visa it's a very critical component to kind of continue to add talent to the pool, right. uh, to the pool. And you know, now we are very lucky because we actually have good operation in the United States. We also have great operation in Canada. Right. And Canada does have a lot of you know, great talent. In addition to that, um, Canada immigration policies have been set and hasn't really changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've been able to attract uh, foreigners to come to, to, right. to our Canadian operation. And we're big in Ottawa and Mississauga and Toronto and Waterloo and, and so. Right. so we have a way. We have a little bit of a way out. You're or, diversified or, for yeah, your business. So yeah. yeah, and then we're we're also in European countries and uh, in India. And so the way well, I think we're reasonably set in this. Having said that, it's still an important element mm -hmm. for us um, and for a lot of the tech company right. in the United States. I mean, are, do you think that there's been anything you know recently that says, okay, maybe it's not going to be as as big of a change, or we're not going to see as much disruption as maybe we we felt at, in the days after the election or even during the campaign? Yeah, I, I do believe that you know when the, when the both sides, whoever the both sides are, mm -hmm. sit sit down and, and hammer out a deal, right. uh, it would not be as quote unquote as robust as it was first okay. stated, um, but I, I, I do expect to move the needle some. That was BlackBerry CEO John Chen with Bloomberg's Garrett DeVink. Coming up, Uber's self-driving car project may be at serious risk. We'll bring you the latest in the Uber Waymo lawsuit next. This is Bloomberg. A story we continue to watch, Waymo and Uber are embroiled in a high-profile lawsuit, with Waymo claiming that Uber is using stolen secrets obtained by one of Google's former executives, Anthony Lewandowski. Now we have new details on Lewandowski's role in the case. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg Technology reporter Eric Newcomer. Eric, at the heart of this case, a, a missing 14,000 <laughs> files yeah. from Google that Lewandowski allegedly downloaded and Uber cannot produce. Where are the missing <laughs> files? I think that's still the question. I mean, Uber's attorneys, you know, are in court and they're like, well, you know, we're still looking for them. But, <laughs> but clearly Lewandowski has them and maybe his, lo maybe his lawyer suggested that he not turn, turn them over? Right, so Lewandowski, you know, is looking to plead the fifth here, uh, which, you know, you in, it's in a civil case can sort of avoid testifying against yourself if there's the threat of a criminal action. And that seemed to be the suggestion here. But that puts Uber in a very difficult position. Yeah, does it because, hurt their case? Yeah, because they, in a civil case, you can't just say, oh, we don't have any evidence, like, prove it. You know, like, you still have to produce evidence to defend yourself. So if their key executive isn't helping them to find the executive, that's really damaging to their defense. It's troubling. But Uber, Uber's lawyers asserted, and Judge Alsap seemed to accept, that it's possible that Uber may, maybe had the access to, to Google's uh, LiDAR technology, but perhaps didn't use it. Is, it. is it possible that Uber, that Lewandowski developed a unique Right. LiDAR in his time, in a short time at Uber? Right, right. It's po and, and that seems like what Uber's probably going to argue. I love the exchange with the judge. judge. He's like, it's possible. It's also possible that they did use it, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be the defense. And then Lewandowski himself will have to deal with, you know, the implications of whether he stole them or not. But I think Uber hopes to argue that, you know, well, we built, we, you look, we built it a different way. We're fine whether he took these files or not. The, but the judge was definitely sort of asking this question, like, why, 
why is this guy still working for you? You guys can fire somebody who doesn't produce documents. You don't have to keep having him at the company. Why, why do you think he is still working at Uber? <laughs> I, I think that is, that's a question you know I'm trying to fi figure out right now. And I mean, he's close to Travis. I forget, one of them said to the other that they're a brother from another I brother. Travis said that, yeah. <laughs> Could never remember which. Well, the, the, the threat here is that Judge Alsap uh, passes a preliminary injunction that stops Uber from developing self-driving car technology. What are the implications if that comes to pass? It just, I mean, it really slows things down. This is a race, and it's a race to get miles on the road. And, you know, Uber's out deploying it in Arizona and uh, Pittsburgh and testing in San Francisco. So it's not something they want to see happen. It's, it would definitely be a blow. And the judge was definitely like, we might be getting into it, preliminary injunction territory. So it's definitely like, you guys need to come up with something, or Google has a pretty strong case. OK, um, last question, though. This is part and parcel of Uber's really terrible now two months. What can they do to turn this around? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think, I mean, every one they have to just bite off and deal with separately. I mean, overall, you know, we still have this Eric Holder report on their cultural problems. They're hiring this COO. They need to give that person a really big role and have them sort of probably disown some of the mistakes of the company's past. And that's the best hope they've got, I think. OK, Eric Newcomer, reporter at Bloomberg Technology. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Coming up. FCC broadband privacy rules were thrown to the side this week by the U.S. Congress. Why your web history could be at risk next. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. President Trump signed two executive orders today aimed at cracking down on international trade abuse. The directives come as the president is set to meet next week with China's Xi Jinping. Mr. Trump has blamed China's policies for U.S. trade deficits and job declines. U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis says Russia has a documented history of violating international law. The chief from the Pentagon spoke today at a conference in London. Russia's violations of international law are now a matter of record, uh, from uh, what happened with Crimea to uh, other uh, aspects of their behavior in mucking around inside other people's elections and that sort of thing. UK-based banks may be left out in the cold as negotiations for an amicable Brexit heat up. EU President Tusk circulated draft guidelines to block members today, saying a free trade agreement can only be finalized after the UK leaves. Administration officials cite concerns an agreement for London banks to access the single market could be impossible. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon formally requested a second referendum on independence today. She says Scots have the right to exercise their right of self-determination. Sturgeon sent the UK Prime Minister a letter formally requesting the transfer of powers to allow the vote. French presidential candidate Francois Fillon says if he's elected, he'll make fighting Islamic extremism a top priority. He's also proposing a European defense alliance led by France and Germany. Fillon and his wife are under investigation for misusing state funds. Elections begin April 23rd. Former finance minister Pravin Gordhan says it's now up to top lawmakers to provide assurances of political stability. He spoke to Bloomberg after his dismissal during an overnight cabinet reshuffle. I think the leadership in government must provide that assurance. I mean, changes will happen, politically speaking, anywhere in the world. Ministers come, ministers go. Uh, but far more important is to look after the welfare of our economy and, and people. Uh, and I think we have many good things going for us in South Africa. Gordon is succeeded by former Home Affairs Minister Malusi Gigaba. 
FIFA has delivered 1,300 pages of internal investigation reports into suspected bribery and corruption to Switzerland's attorney general. But soccer's governing body says it is legally barred from publishing the full report or commenting on evidence from the 22-month probe. The U.S. will also receive copies. And the U.N. is cutting 500 troops from the peacekeeping mission in Congo. The resolution comes after pressure from the Trump administration for reforms. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Brad Stone. Consumer protection advocates were dealt a major blow Tuesday when Congress voted to overturn FCC broadband privacy rules. House Republicans moved to dismantle rules that required Internet service providers to get explicit permission from customers before using or sharing their personal data. Earlier, I sat down with Bloomberg Technology Executive Editor Tom Giles and Bloomberg News reporter Dana Hull and discussed the latest on this story, plus other tech headlines that grabbed our attention this week. Take a listen. In effect, what this does is it gives the F, it takes power away from the FCC to set limits on what internet service providers can and can't do with your information. So the Comcast, AT&T's, Verizon's of the world now have more freedom to do, to, to work with the information that you are putting out online, your search history, um, what, what apps you use. Before, the FCC had like put limits on what they could do with that. Now those limits, they'd never taken effect. Now they won't take effect. And now, in theory, an ISP can take your browsing history, for example, monitor that without your permission, sell it use it to you to, to target ads against you kind of make more money from okay, what you well, do online okay so that's the that's the second question we you, you covered what it means for consumers what does it mean for these businesses the stocks and the indexes that include these telcos and and uh, other broadband stocks are way are way up they're doing really well there's a lot of hopefulness there's a lot of um, expectation that the Trump administration is going to deregulate take away these constraints that lawmakers say the Democrats had, you know, just kind of overreached with the FCC. The idea here is that regu that regulation that was that was, I, I, in theory, holding back the AT&Ts of the world, again, is going to be taken away. They're going to have more freedom. They're going to be regulated more by the FTC and not the FCC, and maybe plow some of that profit back into making innovative products um, or maybe just, you know, lining the pockets of their shareholders. Okay, well, uh, another big uh, news topic of the week, Tesla, everyone's favorite electric car company, Tencent, the Chinese messaging giant, investing uh, $5 billion in Tesla, or no, sorry, 1.8 billion. Five percent. Five percent of the company. Dana, what what does that mean for Tesla? Well, it's a huge deal because you know Tesla's investors have largely been U.S.-based companies and shareholders. Now you have Tencent is now their fifth largest shareholder, so they've vaulted to the top in terms of importance. Even Elon is number one, Tencent is number five, and this comes as Tesla has really kind of struggled to crack the Chinese market. So what's most notable is that when the news came out, you know Elon tweeted, "We're really happy to have Tencent as an investor and an advisor," and I think that really speaks to his relationship with investors is in this advisory well, role. Well, what, what can what can Tencent do? I mean, they are a messaging company. Of course, everyone uses WeChat in in China, but what practically can they do to accelerate the sale of Teslas in China? Well, I think they can really use WeChat as a marketing platform to kind of reach reach consumers. I mean, China is the lar world's largest auto market, and you know. Pony Ma has this vision of not just autonomous cars, but also kind of embedding mapping software into the messaging. And maps are huge for, for, for Tesla. I mean, you've got to have good mapping software if you're going to sell cars in China. Tom, what does it do for Tencent? Tencent, of course, a big investor in Didi. Right. You got to think of Tencent as much more than the WeChat company. They have these big global ambitions to be in a lot of different places, a lot of different markets. They're looking at AI technology for self-driving cars, hence the investment in Didi. They're investing in map technology, which as Dana pointed out, you really need for driverless. They're big. They're making big bets on electric. They're a big uh, an investor in an in electric car company based here in California, but uh, owned by, uh, started by a Chinese guy. Um, so they've got big ambitions in AI, electric, and this kind of furthers them down that road. And, and, and Ma has said he would like to see them get into developing AI technology in the future. Okay, last topic, another SpaceX launch from Cape Canaveral. Dana, it sounds routine, but it, it was anything but. Why was yesterday different for Elon Musk's SpaceX? So this was the first time that SpaceX had 
launched a rocket that they'd used before, which is a really big deal. No one has ever done that. People talk about, oh, the shuttle was reusable. No, like this is the first time that a rocket that had gone to space went to space again. And so it was kind of this twofer where they relaunched the rocket and then they landed it again on the drone ship. And I mean, Elon was euphoric He got a little yesterday. emotional about it, didn't he? Oh my God, he was like, this has been 15 years in the making. He was like sort of weeping. And then he gave this like rambling press conference in Cape Canaveral where you know, he was just so excited. I mean, this is really what SpaceX is all about, right? Like driving down the cost of space so that ultimately humans can live on but Mars. But they have promised eventually 24 hour turnaround time. This rocket was flown a year ago. So how close are they in achieving the ultimate vision? Yeah, so it took them about four months to refurbish this one. They went over all the engines with a fine tooth comb, but eventually they want it to be like flying a 747. You should be able to like fly a rocket, bring it back, refuel it, fly it again. That's still far ways off, but you know, Elon's always pushing the envelope. Okay, I promised a mystery question for both of you guys. So if Elon calls you next year, Tom, we'll start with you and, say, and says, we're taking humans to space. You can be the first journalist in space. Do you do it? Absolutely. I don't think he's going to be calling me. Dana, maybe. Dana, would you do that? It depends on, so I think it would be very exciting to go to Mars, but I'm, I have some concerns about, like, the infrastructure of Mars. Like, am I, when I get there. Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> perhaps on Mars. Maybe, maybe it's an orbit of the moon. I'd fly around the moon. That'd be cool. And remind us what, what his ambitions now are with human space travel. Well, so, so I think part of it is Trump is very interested in the moon. So now, like, Mars is still the long-term goal, but we want to go to the moon first. So he's got two private citizens. If anyone knows who they are, give me a call, that, are gonna, that have paid SpaceX a significant deposit to fly around the moon late next year. That was Bloomberg Technology Executive Editor Tom Giles and reporter Dana Hull of Bloomberg News, who covers all things Elon Musk. As we heard, the SpaceX founder was over the moon after pulling off the first reused rocket mission, and Elon Musk spoke yesterday about what he thought the launch meant for the future of spaceflight. It's an amazing day, I think, for space uh, as a whole, for the, sp for the space industry. It means you, you, can, uh, you can fly and refly an orbit class booster, which is the most expensive part of the rocket. Uh, this is going to be ultimately a, a huge revolution in spaceflight. Coming up, Waze looks beyond navigation to food. We'll dig into what the foray into mobile ordering means for the company's strategy. And the final four tips off Saturday in Glendale, Arizona. The semifinals feature South Carolina against Gonzaga, North Carolina against Oregon. That also means Bloomberg's Brackets for a Cause is coming to an end. We've brought together some of the biggest names in business and finance to compete for the top March Madness bracket, all going to charity. In the lead, Ken Molis and Paul Tudor Jones, but there's still three games left to be played. You can follow all of our Bloomberg Bracket coverage online at Bloomberg.com slash brackets or on the terminal at BRKT Go. This is Bloomberg. Google's Waze is expanding beyond maps. Users of the navigation app can now place orders for pickup at Dunkin' Donuts. The partnership is just the latest move for the company. Earlier this month, it announced plans for its ride-sharing service, Waze Carpool, to go international with an expansion to Brazil. Joining us now is Diane Eisner, head of growth for Waze. Diane, thanks for joining us. Hello, thank you very much. I have much. to say, I'd probably be in traffic right now, lost if it wasn't for Waze. So Good thank you for everything you guys do. It's about to get better. Dunkin' Donuts. I, we should be eating donuts as we talk about this. What <laughs> what what is this partnership about, and what and what does bringing online ordering to Waze mean for the people that use it? So the mission of Waze has always been to save people time every day, five minutes a day every day, uh, for the drivers. And so a natural extension of that is, well, you're already stopping for coffee, you're already stopping for donuts, theoretically, uh, and so why don't we make it easy for you? And so you order ahead before you even start your drive, you get to your destination, you pick up your coffee, and then you head on And this on is to clearly work. a pilot program. So what does it mean? Is it, do you open this up to other merchants now and let basically drivers go and pick up all sorts of food or merchandise that they want? What does the future look like for Order Ahead? So for Order Ahead, Dunkin' Donuts was the first brand to integrate, uh, but we're opening up in April already for other brands will start there. We'll start with food and see how it goes. It's a pilot, uh, but we feel pretty good about it saving our users more time. And well, people are used valuable. to using ways uh, to get around. So this is a different use case. How do you make the case to your to your users that this can there can be an e-commerce dimension to ways? 
Our users have been making that case to us already for some time now. And so they've been looking to us to lead kind of how to improve the commute, and this is just one additional way. And I want to talk about Carpool, but before we get to that, we've, I've always wondered, and I know many other people have as well, Google has another very useful uh, app uh, tool, uh, Google Maps. Yeah. Why not integrate the two? Oh, deep technical stack issues that would make it too difficult. Uh, and so we're both just kind of building out around different use cases. And I don't know, I think everybody should be using both. Well, how are they different? <laughs> Explain that to me. Is, is that a different uh, use case? Is it a different kind of driver? Well, ours is really, like I was saying, it's about saving time every single day. It's about maximum efficiency, improving your commute. And if you look at Google Maps, it's you know beautiful imagery of Google Earth. And it's uh, what I do when I'm biking. And there's, it's a very broad, and I would say we're very deep on the driving use case. OK, let's talk about Waze Carpool. So I know it's here in San Francisco, right, in Sacramento, maybe mm -hmm. Israel. You're bringing it international now to Brazil. Well, start for folks that don't know what it is. What is Waze Carpool? Waze Carpool is very simple. Uh, instead of wazing alone and sitting in traffic and not having the HOV lane, you can now waze together. Uh, and it's actually very different than ride sharing in that uh, you're already going in the same direction. You're already headed to Bloomberg, for example. Uh, and then you just pick up another wazer on the way. So it's reinforcing this community, it's saving time, and then it's fighting our main enemy, which is traffic. OK, I yeah. thought you were going to say Uber. <laughs> <laughs> no, traffic, of no. course. Is there a commercial <laughs> aspect to waze? Is carpool. I mean, for things like uh, you know Uber Pool or Lyft Line, money changes hands. It's a big incentive for drivers yeah. to go and pick someone else up. Do you, have you introduced an aspect of commerce to Waze Carpool, and will you? We have. It's a very different model in that, again, you can't be a professional driver because this is really just already going on your own route. Uh, and we limit the amount of times a day you can do it. You do get paid as a driver. And as a rider, you are, are paying a little money, but not very much. So here in the Bay Area, it's about 4x more than Waze Carpool if you wanted to use a ride sharing service or a taxi or something like that. Uh, so there is money, but there's a taxable limit, which is 54 cents per mile. If we can pay the drivers that exact amount, then it's not taxable for them. It's literally covering fuel and wear and tear. A lot of this happens organically and has for years crossing the Bay Bridge and in Washington, D.C. with the slug lines. Yeah. Can you partner with cities to bring ways carpooling into the, this activity that people are already doing? Well, now that you ask, we already partner with 250 cities around the world for Waze itself, where we, even in Rio, we just worked together with them to reduce their congestion by 27% in Rio. Uh, and we're doing this with partners all around. So yes, I think with the huge amount of drivers that we have already as this driving community, plus the cities we already work with, and this very simple technology, it should be a very easy way for us to get a matching at a scale that hasn't really existed before. That's what we hope. It's easy for us uh, pesky journalists to look at this and, and, and conclude that this is Alphabet's way of backing into the ride sharing category. Is, is, is it, I mean, how, how different is it? Can you get to formal ride sharing with Waze carpooling eventually? Is that the plan? Um, so <laughs> I wouldn't assume that there's much of a plan with any of the big tech companies. First of all, uh, we have this mindset of try things, see what works, and Waze, again, we've like been even since the acquisition full on in our mission. And it's really about what's gonna happen in the future of mobility. We know there are gonna be flying cars and we know all of that and there will be no more traffic, but we're very practical. How are we gonna get there today? What can we do right now that kind of blazes that trail? What are the services? What are the, the, the software that, that's gonna be needed? And so that's really where we're focused. Not part of a bigger strategy. That's a big one as it is. Get rid of traffic altogether. You think that's an achievable goal? Um, I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be working on this. But you know, obviously, I'm a bit of a dreamer. You know, starting ways and all of these, uh, you know, the, the startup mentality. But again, it's the practical look at if right now half of the wazers we had even in LA, if they were wazing together instead of alone, we would shave 10 minutes to start off of a one-hour commute. It's well, it's feasible. Well, earlier in the show, we talked about the Waymo self-driving car efforts. Do you see ways as a platform for Alphabet to deploy self-driving cars eventually? I think that it would make sense down the road, not just for Waymo, but for self-driving cars to be a core part of a foundational vehicle strategy for any service. Um, uh, but right now, again, it's about what are the services, how are we getting the data, what are we doing today, and we're letting other people worry about the kind of hardware component, right? It's like we are not making the hardware or making the Do software. Do you work with the Waymo unit at, uh, inside Alphabet at all? Have you 
Data, you're not supposed to ask me that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. Okay, well, next time we talk, we'll have to order some Dunkin' Donuts uh, via Waze's order head feature. Absolutely. Diane Eisner, head of growth for Waze, thank you. Coming up, employees on Wall Street are addicted to texting using WhatsApp and other services to cover their tracks. We'll explain next. This is Bloomberg. Now to one of the most popular stories on the Bloomberg. Illegal texting on Wall Street seems to be going off the rails. Traders are using apps like WhatsApp and Snapchat, which are virtually untraceable, as ways to skirt financial regulation and share dubious information. Bloomberg News reporter Laura Keller spoke about it earlier on Bloomberg Markets. SEC and FINRA, two of, you know, of our agencies that regulate banks and also asset managers for the SEC, say that any business who is in financial services actually has to keep those business records. So if you're an employee that's texting, it's not you that would be breaking that law, but it's your firm that needs to be able to see anything that you're using to conduct business. Of course, if that's a personal friend and sometimes that gets a little gray, that part would be fine. You could text about that. Just nothing in the terms of how you're going about with business communication. Well, but so many customers are people's friends, so that gray area gets pretty big. Some people have already gotten in trouble over this, right? Yes, exactly. So we had two cases in the story that we cited. One that happened yesterday, it was an ex-Jeffreys banker mm -hmm. um, in the UK who was cited by the authorities there for sending to friends, essentially, um, some information about pending deals. He was a banker. So nothing in that case was illegal in the sense that he wasn't benefiting from that tr you know, trade. There's no profit there. There's no loss mitigated. But he wasn't supposed to be doing that, and it was supposed to be kept in confidence. Ah. So he was fined. The other case that we have seen was more egregious in the eyes of the U.S. authorities, and that one is an indictment against a money manager for the New York State pension. And those individuals, when they manage money, they're not allowed to accept any entertainment, um, you know, gifts and things from anyone who is trying to do business with them. So there you had a case that prosecutors are still going forward with. Um, one of the salespeople isn't cooperating and the money manager has pled not guilty. There, authorities said that they were using WhatsApp to try to evade capture about uh, these uh, bribes. On purpose. On purpose, exactly. So that case, as we say, you know, is still in court. We don't have a verdict on that yet. But those are the two sort of very far you know, securities laws, potential breaking that we see. The other things in the story, though, that we looked at, a lot of it really is, you know, I, I just don't want my boss to know that I'm complaining about work, or maybe a little bit more gray area where I have a trader who's leaving and probably shouldn't be spreading that around the street, but I do want to let some of my friends who yeah, also happen to be sure. my colleagues at rival firms know that he's leaving. So it does seem pretty rampant from your story, and the examples you're talking about seem like they're pretty common. Right. What do these firms do? Are they are they going so far as to say, you know what, you can't even have your phone on the floor? Exactly, Julie. So some firms, it, most of them really have some policy in place to say, look, we really don't want these phones on the floor because we know that it really opens up all of these issues. Now, the enforcement area is where we see a lot of the differences. I talked with a lot of different people. Um, some said, look, we have a policy, we pretty much ignore it. Mm -hmm. In our sales meeting, you know, my boss is there, he sees someone texting, right. doesn't so say anything about it. So they sort of over, turn a blind eye to it. Right. Uh, as we talk about financial deal, regulation is there any sense that this is actually a rule that could go away I did talk with one professor you know who sort of felt like possibly just um, as we see at large with a lot of the bank regulation right now that anyone who sort of has funding might get a pullback on that funding and therefore there won't be as much of you know the SEC oversight because they're just not able to look at so it'll as be an things. enforcement question rather right. than actually getting rid of the regulation right but I haven't heard anyone talking about trying to pull this back it's a very well established rule that was Bloomberg's Laura Keller. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Remember, all episodes are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at, at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.